Well, good morning, everybody. How y'all doing? Is everybody happy to be here, or was anybody drug here and forced to be here today? Well, at least nobody raised your hand. I appreciate that. Um, I guess, well, well, let, let, me, let me start off by saying that well, one of the funniest things in the world is when the Baptist preacher preaches on uh, the, the water being turned into wine. <laughs> so I have a title to this message, and here's the title to my message. <laughs> Jesus turned the water into wine. Take your Bible out if you would and turn to John chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 11, and then I want to look at verses 23 and 20 through 25. And, and uh, in the meantime, today's message is entitled, Shh, Jesus Turned the Water into Wine. Now, many of you are going to think that the reason I say, Shh, Jesus Turned the Water into Wine, is because we're Baptists, and as a Baptist, we're always opposed to drinking and alcohol and what have you. That could be further from the truth. The reason I'm saying, Shh, Jesus turned the water into wine. Is This is one of the miracles that Jesus did in secret and only a handful of people knew that he had done what he had done. Now, I do also know that we live in the United States of America and I do know that we live in South Mississippi and in the South there are plenty of drinkers and, and alcohol is alive and well. If you know that, would you say Amen. I mean, you know that it's like that. So many of them uh, who are not born-again believers of Jesus Christ love to quote the fact that Jesus turned the water into wine. In fact, if you've ever heard a drinker say, water into wine, would you raise your hand just so I can see how many of you? You have. You've heard that. Of course, I always want to say, if that's the one time you listen to what Jesus said, why don't you listen to everything else that he had to say? All right, because later on he's going to come back and he's going to say, I will not drink of this cup until I with it in the kingdom of heaven later on. But this is about the miracle today. This is about the reason of the miracle. This is about what, uh, what takes place. The text is not given to us as management of alcohol, even though I will have to talk about that a little bit today. The text is given to us today to see that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is the Christ, and this is the very first miracle that we see Jesus performing in the Scriptures. Now, I know if you've read the book of Thomas, which is not contained in the Bible, and the reason it's not contained in the Bible is written hundreds and hundreds of years after Jesus Christ had been on the face of the earth, and it says in there that he did some miracles when he was a child, and that's the, the Hebrew word for that is hogwash, and the Greek word for that is baloney, and it did not exist. Because contained in the Scripture are the things that we need to know about Jesus. And the Scripture says this is the first sign that Jesus did. So this is the very first time that Jesus actually turns water into wine. Now before I read that particular part of chapter 2, I want to drop down and I want to, read, I want to start reading in verse... Uh, 23, 24, and 25. Now, the reason I want to set up 23, 24, and 25, chapter 2 really doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless you get the last part of the chapter. Chapter 3, when uh, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night, doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you don't get what's in these three verses right here. And Jesus going in and cleansing the temple doesn't make any sense at all if you don't get what's, what, what's contained in verses 23, 24, and 5. And all of these stories, if you'll notice, all of these events are wrapped around the of Scripture. So I want you to make sure that you get these three verses of Scripture. In fact, I am hoping that you brought a highlighter or a pen or something with you, or, and, and either in your digital Bible or your hard copy Bible, that you'll actually highlight these three verses. Look in chapter 2, verse 23. It says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast... Now this is not when he did the miracle. This is just them recording in the Scripture. When he was at the Passover feast, many believed in his name... When they saw the signs. Okay, so they believed in Jesus because they had seen the miracles. They had seen the signs. Look what it says, the signs that he was doing. Verse 24. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about a man, for he himself knew what was in a man. And all God's people said. Now, if you, that's a dangerous verse of Scripture right there. 
Because, and I'm going to talk about that verse of Scripture more tonight than I do this morning in the cleansing of the temple. But what that verse of Scripture is saying and teaching us right there is sometimes we can believe something and not really believe it and only think that we believe it only to find out later on that we didn't really believe it unto an action change in our lives. So I want you to come back and hear that message that goes along with that tonight. Now, having said that, all of chapter 2 and all of chapter 3 is put around that so that we can see this. So let's go back now and let's look at chapter 2, verse 1. Pick it up in verse 1. It says, On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And by the way, those people who doubt the Bible and all these kind of things, the city of Cana has just recently in the last four or five years been dug up, excavated, and when you go over there to the Holy Land, they'll take you to this spot where this took place. In fact, 10 years ago when I was at right after Katrina, the year after the year of Katrina, I was able to go to the Holy Land and I stood right here on this very spot that this place. It's right here. On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. So uh, Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. So notice Jesus' mama is invited, Jesus is invited, and then all the disciples are, wedding, uh, are, are coming to the wedding. And by the way, I must say too that Reasonable Heights Baptist Church, we've had more weddings in the last 12 months than I can shake a stick. I think I've married almost two people a month for the last nine months. Isn't that something that's amazing? We've got, got another wedding coming up this week. Miss Sherry, are y'all ready? No. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Okay. So we got another wedding coming up. Jesus also was invited to the wedding and with the disciples. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, "They have no wine." Now this this is a catastrophe at a wedding, and I'll explain the catastrophe a little later on. Verse four. And Jesus said to her, "Woman," which is the way you you, you called a woman back in that day. You called a woman a woman, right? Now, there wasn't any dispute about that like we have today. One, <laughs> I didn't really mean to go there in this message, but that's the truth. I mean, that was the enduring term. Uh, you know, you might, today we might say that lady. Well, back then you say woman, okay? Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. What he means by that, it's not time for me to go to the cross yet. It's not time for me to take away the sins of the world. It's not time for me to hang on the cross and say, it is finished. And his mother said to the servants, now not to Jesus, but she said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. (laughs) Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Verse 7, Jesus said to his servants, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he says to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it, and when the master of the feast tasted the water, now the, now, the water now become wine, he did not know where it had come from though the servants who had drawn the water knew. In other words, the master had no idea what was going on. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and he said to them, everyone serves the good wine first and when people get uh, drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of the signs Jesus did at Canaan in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. And after this, he went down to Capernaum with his mothers and his brothers and his disciples and they stayed there for a few days. And all God's people said, okay, again, the name of the message is, shh, Jesus turned the water into wine. Turning water into wine was the first sign that he was the Son of God. Turning the water into wine was the very first sign the Scripture contains that Jesus does a miracle. And he's doing a sign, and he's doing the sign so that everybody will know that he's the Son of God. You remember we went through chapter 1. Y'all remember it took me four weeks to get through chapter 1 because in those four weeks we had to be able to cover all the names of Jesus because they want the book of John has been written according to chapter 20 in that verse of Scripture in this. He says these things are, are written so that we might know that Jesus is the Christ. 
Christ. Everybody, the, the whole purpose of the book of John is to let us know that Jesus really is the Son of God and He really is who He says He is. Note the, the text here calls this a sign and the text doesn't even call it a miracle. The text does not say that Jesus did a miracle at Canaan. The text says Jesus did a sign there. Because the reason he calls it a sign is because it's the sign of what Jesus did that proves that he is who he says that he is. It was a miracle of great magnitude. Now, I don't know if you call what we read in the text. It said that there were six jars of 20 to 30 gallons of water. So if you have 20 to 30 gallons of water in each jug and there were six of them and it's turned into wine, how much wine would you have? <laughs> You would have well over 100. You would have somewhere between, if my math is right, when I figure this, somewhere between 120 and 180 gallons of wine. Is, am I wrong on that or is my math right on that? Six, six times, no, yeah, six times 20 or six times 30 is going to be somewhere between 120 and 180 gallons of wine. But the point is not that Jesus could take that much wine and instantaneously turn it into um, uh, wa turn, turn water into wine. The point is that Jesus is exposing his glory that he had veiled when he came to earth so that people could see that he really is who he says he is, which is the Son of God. Jesus' glory was veiled when the divine took on human form, but his glory is revealed in this miracle that takes place. When Jesus came to earth and was laid in the manger, the people couldn't look at him and know that he was the Christ by looking at him. You know, a lot of the pictures and the paintings that you see that came out of the, the, the 1200, 1300, 1400 always have a picture of Jesus. They've got a glow around his face. He's here on the face of the earth. Well, that wasn't, that wasn't the case when he was here on the face of the earth because when he was here on the face of the earth, he looked just like you and I did. He, was, he, he came and he veiled his glory, but then what he did is the actions that he took, the things that he did began to pull the veil back just a little bit so people one by one could see who he is. Those of you who know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you were walking around in darkness for a little while. You didn't know who Jesus was. And then all of a sudden one day... For some reason, God allowed the veil of, his, of the glory of Jesus Christ to be pulled back and you saw that. That took place on the day that you got saved. Because on the day that you got saved, you realized that when you saw Jesus, you saw the perfect Son of God. You understood that He went to the cross to take your sins upon Himself so that He could take those sins away. And as He did that, you fell down on your face before God and you cried out and you said something like, God, God, forgive me because I am a, a wretched sinner. Just like the guy in Matthew who beats his chest and says, Lord, I have sinned against you and you fell down before God. And he reaches down and he picks you up and he loves you like a child and you serve him like a slave because you have that kind of respect for him now because you've seen what you've been able to see. Well, that happens on that day that this takes place for a handful of people but it's only for a handful of people who are seeing that. Which brings me to the second point of the message today, which is this. The sign was done in secret. Would everybody please say that with me? The sign was done in secret. That's a lot harder to say than it actually sounds, isn't it? The sign was done in secret. But the master, I want to look at the text right there. It says the master did not know where the wine had come from. He didn't know that the water had been turned into wine. He, he didn't know what all was going on. He was just fascinated that the best wine was brought out when it was. Only a handful of people saw the sign it was given. That handful of people that saw the sign it was given was Mary, the mother of Jesus, who when there was a problem, she took the people to Jesus and says, whatever he says, do it. And then he, he, she knows what takes place. Then you've got these servants who come in and Jesus tells them to go fill up these vats that you have and, and fill them all up with the water. They go fill them up with water and as they begin to pour it out, the water, instead of water coming out of the vat, the wine begins to come out of the vat. So, the, so, the, so they have seen what takes place. And then you have the twelve disciples. All of them are with Jesus at this point. He's watching. They're hanging on. They're, Jesus is discipling them, spending time with them. So Jesus is making sure that they're standing all around so that they can see 
who he is. Now, in the book of John, we're going to find out tonight when we look at this, the book of John, that Jesus is able to know everything that's going on in everybody's head, mind, and heart that he comes in contact with on the face of the earth. Jesus looks at those disciples and he knows that they believe in him. But he also looks, get this, he also looks at the 12 servants and the scripture does not tell us that the 12 servants came to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. They saw the sign and they believed that Jesus had performed a miracle and that he was a miracle worker, but they did not believe that he was the Son of God. They got confused about it being a sign instead of being a miracle. You see the difference between the sign and the miracle? The miracle is what is used to build the sign to show that Jesus is there. Now, this is what lost people do when they start reading the Bible. Lost people are driven to the Bible because something's going on in their lives. They want to be healed. They want to have something, some miracle. They need a bunch of cash to come in. They need You can insert anything you want to in there. They'll go in there and they'll go to the in the Bible where these things happen and they'll try to replicate what the people did hoping that the same miracle will happen to them to solve the problem that they've got. None of the miracles that are contained in the Gospels are there for the sake of the people whom the miracle is performed on. Are they blessed because the miracles are performed on them? Absolutely yes. But why does Jesus do the miracle? to be a sign to everyone that Jesus is Lord. After all, this kingdom, my kingdom is not of what? This world. So it's not about all the stuff that takes place in this life as much as it is all the stuff that's going to take place when the kingdom of God comes down to heaven and we're in the millennial kingdom and God sits back and fixes everything and makes it right as it should be. You see, the sign was done in secret and only a handful of these people saw that. Now, understand that when the disciples saw it, when 11 of the 12 disciples saw this, a light bulb starts going off in their head. This is no ordinary man that we are following. This is the Messiah. This is the King of Israel. This is the Son of God. This is the light. This is the Word who became flesh and made His dwelling with us. This truly is the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. Everything that was contained in chapter 1. So the miracle is confirming who He is, and they've been there. And get this, Jesus knows of those 12 disciples He knows 10 of them are figuring it out. And he knows one of them is not. By the way, which one is not figuring it out? Judas, the very one who's going to betray him later on. Now, did it look like Judas's heart believed that Jesus was the Messiah? Absolutely, because Judas actually did believe that Jesus was the Messiah. He just believed the Messiah would look different than what Jesus knew the Messiah would look like. You see, Judah thought, I mean, uh, Judas thought that Jesus would be an earthly Messiah who would remove the oppression from him, and he tried to force Jesus' hand at the Passover to make all of that take place. He did not believe in Jesus as the Son of God, as the Lamb of God, as the light of the world, as the Word who became flesh, as you and I believe. So Jesus does this miracle, and it was kept secret because it would have been a public shame. And listen, listen to this, right? It would have been a public shame for the groom, the bridegroom, if there had not been enough wine for the wedding party and the guest. Now, if you ever have a party at your house and you run out of food, you'd be ashamed because you ran out of food. Well, that would be a crying shame if you ran out of food, when you, especially if you ever invited me over to the house. You ran out of food, that'd be a crying shame. Right? No, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. But anyway, you would be all upset because see, there wasn't enough of everything to go around. Well, in that day, instead of the bridegroom, bride's family throwing the the wedding, the groom himself had to be financially strong enough to support himself so that it was he that's bearing the cost of the wedding so that we know that the girl that we're giving away to the groom has the ability to take care of the wife that he's now going to take on the family that's going to come along with that. That's the reason the grooms were usually a little older by the time that they got married. But when that went, there was actually a law in this town, there's actually a law during this time under the uh, under the, the Pharisaical law that if you were to run out of wine or if you were to run out of food, and you could be charged with 
inhospitality, being unhospitable to the people who had come to your house. You could just like, you know, do you know that if you go too fast down Highway 63 and there's a highway patrolman on Highway 63, what's going to happen to you? You're going to get a ticket. They're going to give you a warning. Okay. You're going to get a ticket. You can be ticketed for that. You can, he could, this guy could have been ticketed for not having enough wine for everybody going on. It's a thing. But he goes, Jesus goes ahead. He turns the water into wine. But he does this in secret so that Mary and the disciples and the, and, and the servants are the only one that sees what's going on. Which brings me to the third point. Jesus' glory was made manifest during a struggle of the bridegroom. You see, this happened during a struggle for the bridegroom. Mary, Jesus is, or Mary says, go, you know, give him, go, uh, Mary said they have no wine. Mary did not say to Jesus, go turn the water into wine. Mary said to Jesus, Jesus, they're out of wine. Right? That's just, that's all she said. Mary, Jesus' mother, was in on the struggle that the bridegroom was having right then. She knew their marriage would start off with a scandal if they didn't get some more wine. So she goes to Jesus. Mary did not bring the problem to Jesus because he was a miracle worker because remember this is the first miracle that Jesus is now doing so Mary doesn't even know that Jesus is a miracle miracle worker. She brought it to him because as the Son of God, which she knows he is the Son of God. She knew that as the Son of God, He always knows what to do in every situation. You know, by the way, is why we go to God in prayer a lot of times. We don't know what... Sometimes we go to the Lord in prayer, we tell Him one thing, God says no, because He knows the situation fully and we only know it partly. So she knew she could take this problem to Jesus and Jesus would handle this problem. By the way, how many of you in here have ever had Jesus handle a problem for you? Amen. Okay. Mary told the servants, and I love this. She walks over to the servants. I don't know how many there was. She says, do what he says. Do what he says. Is that not the greatest piece of advice for a born-again believer of Jesus Christ right now? Well, I got a problem. Do what he says. Go to Jesus. Do what he says. Go to Jesus. Do what he says. After all, he is the Word who became flesh. And what is the Word? This is the Word, which has got 66 different books. And Jesus came, became the Word, walked on the face of the earth so that we could see the Word in the flesh and live here. And Mary says, go to Him and do what He says. So we go to Jesus with our problems. He tells us what to do. And then we don't decide whether we're going to do what He tells us to do or not. We're just going to do what it is that He says we do. Okay? All right, which brings me to, I'm going to go straight to my applications. I'm getting my applications a little quicker than normal here because I think there's a few things I need to handle. Application number one is this, what the text does not teach. I want to talk about what the text does not teach for just a minute before I move on to what it does teach. What the text does not teach is getting tipsy at a wedding is fine with God. The, te- the text is not teaching that it's okay to get drunk or get smashed and is a bridegroom or is a bride or whatever before the wedding, have a party afterward to get drunk and all those kind of things. That's not what it's talking about. Look at what Jesus, look at what Jesus, the Word, has to say only in the book of Proverbs. This is, I'm, I'm containing this only to the book of Proverbs, but the Word speaks from Genesis all the way to Revelation. But I do want to say what Jesus had to say. And by the way, Proverbs talks about wisdom. If you look at wisdom, you'll understand from chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4, Christ is the wisdom, is the logos, is the word. So these are what Jesus says about drinking. So number one, Proverbs 14, 7 teaches that alcohol leads to violence. Y'all ever know anybody get beat up before? Uh, Have you ever seen a movie where the people got drunk in the bar and fought with each other? Y'all don't watch much television. You got one guy over here that saw it. This little he said, I saw that. I saw that. Happens on Matt Dillon every week, doesn't it? I mean, if you watch the Me Channel, it happens all the time. Get a little alcohol in you, you start and you get ready to whoop you up. But Proverbs 20, verse 1 says, alcohol lead, well, verse 17 says, alcohol leads to violence. Verse 20, verse 1 says, alcohol leads to anger and mocking. You get mad. You start mocking people. You think I'm too drunk. And you say, right. Somebody's saying, Brother Steve, you're too good at this. Remember, I hadn't always been a preacher, okay? 
Proverbs 23, verse 19 and 20. Why, wise people don't drink. The scripture is adamant that you have any authority over somebody else. You are not to drink. And, you're not, and if you've got any sense to yourself, and, and, and you know, I, I get so tickled. I have a, a cousin, this Tynell's cousin, he's mine now by marriage. I love the guy to death. And uh, he fell in love with a woman that was going to be a missionary. And he tried to explain to her that drinking was all right. And he had come out of a, 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 a Catholic background. Just, he had just come out of a Catholic background. I'm saying he wasn't. I'm saying he was good Catholic, but he just come out of the Catholic background. And he said it's okay to drink because uh, Jesus turned. He said these words: Jesus turned the water into wine. And then she, he goes back. She goes back. She explains to her that's not what the scriptures teach. And he says, "I tell you what, I'll prove it." And he goes back home to prove his point. And he read the Bible from beginning to end. And when he came back. To her, he was saved and he never touched alcohol again because he saw in the scriptures that wise people don't drink. Okay? All right, uh, Proverbs 23, verses 29 through 30. Drinking causes sorrow, causes babbling, causes red eyes. You know, it magnifies. Instead of dumbs down, it magnifies. Uh, it says in 23, verse 21, drunkenness causes poverty. I'm here to tell you, I know that one firsthand. Having been raised by two alcoholics who had to drink, had to have two fifths of whiskey and three cases of beer and two uh, packs, two cartons of cigarettes, and I grew up thinking that we were poor. But my daddy made good money, but there wasn't anything left over to buy clothes with. You know, it says in 32, uh, 23, 32, alcohol bites like a snake. How many of y'all would come back if I brought a snake in here? I'm not going to. <laughs> this guy, hey, I would come see the snake. There we go. Me and you, bro. Well, if I bring the snake in, it'll just be you, brother. <laughs> Proverbs 23, 33, alcohol leads to adulterous thoughts and perverse thoughts. It lifts, lowers your inhibitions. Verse 44, physical instability. You know, y'all, y'all remember, how many in here, who is in here old enough to remember Walker Foster? All right, if you've watched Dean, Walker Foster, he's up stumbling around. Perfect depiction of that. Uh, chapter four, I mean, chapter 23, verse 44, physical instability, verse 45, alcohol is addictive. It grabs a hold of a person. The Chinese have a proverb, and they say, first the man takes a drink, and then the drink takes a man. That's their proverb. Proverbs 31, verses 4 and 5, those in authority should not drink because they're making decisions over other people, and if you've got authority over other people, you shouldn't be everywhere. You lose your ability to reason and to think just right. And in uh, the th- verse 31, uh, 6 and 7, alcohol is for the dying. To the man, to the woman, to the person who's dying, and there's nothing you can do, give them some alcohol. Let them drink it. Timothy, yes, drank a little bit for his stomach one time, but we don't need that because we got pills today for all that kind of stuff. Um, what I do want to talk about some things that we can actually pull from the text, which actually do mean something here. Number one is go to Jesus in your times of struggle because he loves you like nobody else does. These people that had the wedding knew who Jesus was because they invited Mary and Jesus and the disciples. Now, I don't know if they wanted some high-profile people there, if they happened to know them well, but they invited Jesus, and, and, and Mary sees right off the bat the grooms in a world of hurt. And she says, well, I'll tell you what. When I'm in a world of hurt, I go to Jesus. And then I just do whatever he says. So she takes the groom and people over to Jesus, and Jesus cares about what's going on. Now, the miracle is not done for this purpose, but in God's love for all of mankind, he made sure that Jesus was at the right place at the right time to take care of this particular problem. So he goes to Jesus, and Jesus turns the water into wine. Jesus cares about the bride, He cares about the groom. He cares about all the people who showed up at the wedding. He cares about the children that will be born from the marriage. He cares about the grandchildren that will be born from that marriage. After all, Jesus went to the cross to die for every single one of them. Third third thing to take away is this. Know that Jesus cares about you and your 
particular situation. Jesus knows when we're struggling and He cares about our particular situation. Many of you today are in a situation. Now, circumstances come and go. Sometimes things get better, sometimes things get worse, but there's always struggle, there's always situations. There's not a single one of them that catches Jesus Christ by surprise. Since He knows your heart, and since He knows who you are, and since He knows all the circumstances in the world, He knows what needs to happen in your life, and He will be there for you. Know that Jesus cares about you and your situation. And if He needs to, He will move heaven and earth to get you out of the situation. If He chooses to leave you in the situation, His grace will be sufficient for you as you go through the situation and He accomplishes what He intends to inside of it. And then fourthly, realize that your situation will always lead to God's glory. It's always a sign that points to God. You ever know? I want you to look at something. If you will look at the most godly people that you know, if you'll just take a few minutes one day and think about their lives and all that you know about them, you'll be able to come up with event, circumstances, and situations through their lives where they went through suffering, but yet they got closer and closer to Christ and they died to self, and Christ began to live in them, and they shine in such a way that when you look at them, Jesus' glory is not veiled, but Jesus' glory is pulled back so that you can see Christ in them and see God's glory in them. God never does a miracle that the miracle is not a sign pointing to Jesus Christ who hung on the cross so that we can come to know Christ. And number five, When you go to Jesus, this is the simplest one. Just do what He says. Now, how do you know what He says unless you listen to His Word? That's why you read His Word every day. Jesus Jesus cares for you. He has a Word for you, and He wants you to do what He tells you to do. And He loves you. He loves you just the way that you are, but He loves you far too much to let you stay that way. Let's pray together. Dear God in heaven, thank you.